Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for Courageous Conversations. It's, um, it's taken some courage to get up here and do this, so I think it's going to be a really exciting night. My name is Susan Smitten. I'm the Executive Director of Raven and uh, the host of tonight's event here at Sunset Labs and through Stream of Consciousness. We hope that this night inspires new ways of being and thinking. Um, we certainly have some amazing people who are going to join us both here and by video. And we want to begin what we hope will be many more conversations. This is sort of the start of a practical way of putting reconciliation into action to advance intercultural understanding and an awareness of justice frameworks which support a move to a more equitable country that takes into account Aboriginal values and laws. We're exploring the idea of ultimately, out of all of this information and more conversations, creating a series of online learning modules and that combine real world community building um, and help Canadians to better understand Indigenous rights and legal issues. Uh, the online lear learning series could offer resources, skills, connections to foster understanding and compassion and a way forward between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. So tonight's conversation is literally a kickoff. It's just a starting point. We don't know where it's going to go. We don't know what's going to happen. And that's pretty exciting. It's kind of cool to be in this ground where anything could happen. And to begin the evening, I want to acknowledge our gratitude for being able to gather here on the unceded traditional Lekwungen territory. And I would like you to join me in please welcoming Rose Henry. Many of you, many of you know Rose, a formidable Coast Salish activist and longtime Victoria resident, here tonight to help us acknowledge the original keepers of the land. Hi, Rose. Hi, Chikasiam. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me up here. Um, it's, been, it's been a long journey. But this is the first time that I've been invited to this type of a forum. And so I, too, am a guest on this territory. I am originally from my mother's side, from the Slyaman Nation. From my father's side, I am Plohus. I resided here in Metula for the last 34 years. 32 of those years in the inner city of Victoria and two years in Saanich. So I want to say thank you very much to the original people of this land for allowing me to continue to do what I'm doing here. Aho. Okay, were you going to drum? Oh, yes. Rose has become really famous for this song. There's a few songs that I consistently sing. I'm pretty sure everybody here knows the Women's Warrior song. It is a song that was gifted to a handful, to a handful of us women from the In 2008, I was one of a handful of people that walked from Victoria to Ottawa to raise the awareness of the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so before we left on our walk, we were given permission to carry this song. Yeah. 
Thank you. Law is something that's constituted through our relationships with one another, with the living world, and our non-human relations. Tonight, you are here either in this space or via live stream, and my understanding is there's something in the order of about 100 people live stream with us. Um, for a discussion in part on how indigenous legal traditions are shaping our world. As First Nations are winning case after case in Canadian courts, how can settlers and allies put reconciliation into action to realize rights that belong not only to the first peoples of this land, but to the earth itself? And we're here to open up a space for conversations that are not either or. We want to land in that sort of messy place of nuance, trying to get at some important points that, depending on where you live or work, m may require courage, hence the name of this gathering, or just a willingness to be op open and vulnerable and even awkward. So I encourage you to embrace that. Um, we invited poet Janet Rogers, who some of you may know, uh, the Mohawk Tuscarora writer from Ontario Six Nations and Victoria's former poet laureate to be here because her words speak so clearly to so many of these issues. And she couldn't join us, but she sent us a couple of her poems by video. And it's really exciting. She produced this powerful video in response to Canada's 150th birthday and the Year of Reconciliation in 2017. I feel it's a cogent way to really start this discussion. So here is Confederation 150. Ah, Canada. Standing defiantly behind the line that doesn't quite protect or define as it was wished and won by war. These spoils are yours. So what can you claim with flimsy parchment that proclaims ownership, citizenship, a severely superficialness, the taking and overtaking, the dismissing and denying, buried under layers, the ice is petrifying, making hard rock shields labeled Canadian, a nationalistic resource where nothing cultivates and nothing to trade. Did you think the steel staples would hold it together? Did you remember to ask permissions or make paper consultations using the Queen's English? Ah, uh, Canada, do not slip me the tongue and call it a French kiss. How do two languages survive, 65 or more, an agenda of insults with your colonial ideas of distinction? Pretty little tricks and lyrics sung from the immigrants' hearts. And your crests in cloth tells all, as two red nations stand divided either side a dying maple leaf, a thinly penciled treaty and centered symbol almost stable until autumn's justice comes and sucks the truth from it and we begin again. Ah, Canada. Offering songs to join in false chorus, another choice to remain forgetful, but your soldiers stay true and their patriot hearts continue to glow with pride. While we, the originals, write our own journals after disrupted chapters leaving my people to fight, flee, or die. The strength of our identity was born before you were even formed and doesn't include hops and hockey. Who are you exactly? Listening to the mother corp with terrestrial signals, mining stories and rewriting ours, your race hate filled comments take this country's temperature and count its votes. So listen close. There is no home if there is no native land. Sing about it all you want. The harmonies will always be off key to me. And the chief, reciting his lament 50 years previous, said it all from the West. Ah, Canada. How many of me had to die so you can be you? Reconciliation is not something you read about. It's something you do.
when she sent that to me, she said, well, I'll share this, but I, I hope your audience can take it. <laughs> Reconciliation is something you do. That's why we're here tonight. So I'm going to give you just a quick snapshot of how the rest of the evening will unfold. Um, I will do a very brief overview of what Raven is for some of the audience members who are new to us, particularly those on live stream, and some updates for those of you who do follow our work. Then our moderator for tonight's discussion, Adam Olson, will join me with our panel members, and they will each have a little bit of time to introduce themselves, and we're gonna dig right into 30 or 40 minutes of courageous conversations. And try to, with a goal of building you know, a kinder, more understanding society, where the caretaker values of indigenous peoples inform the decisions and visions of this country as a whole. For those watching online, and we know that there's a bunch of you out there, I encourage you to get involved. We are, we have literally like a, like a phone-in show, we have people standing by to take your questions. And so send them in, we will try to get some of them brought into the discussion later on in the evening. And then we will wrap with a chance for our speakers to summarize and offer some thoughts on calls to action. So without further ado, what is Raven? Respecting Aboriginal values and environmental needs. Raven is helping with the transition from a colonial era to a reconciliation era, powered by investments by ordinary people in this idea that indigenous peoples should have equal access to the justice system and the courts. And we're the only nonprofit charitable organization in Canada still after 10 years doing this. We are raising legal defense funds to see our vision and mission through. The list of victories and accomplishments is a confirmation, I think, of our foundational mandate. The idea that rule of law and the constitu Constitution and the rights of Indigenous peoples enshrined in that Constitution have the ability to hold the Canadian industrial state to account. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, these cases have advanced legal precedents and advanced integration of Indigenous ways of knowing and being and at the same time protected land and water and critical habitat. So we're pretty proud of that. For example, and there are some slides here to help uh, illustrate this, the first pulled together campaign against Enbridge. Quashed by the courts because no consultation, no project. Raven supported seven nations following their lead mobilizing for the first time grassroots power and leveraging relationships and philanthropic funding. Chilcotin versus Tosico Mines. This has been a nine year struggle still ongoing for the Chilcotin to protect Tultan B, the settler name is Fish Lake, from the open pit mine that Tosico wants to put there. Raven has supported two federal environmental reviews for two federal rejections. And then Tosico responded by launching judicial review after judicial review, and it's still before the courts, and it's still ongoing, so the prece precedents are still being written here, but we're with them. The Peel watershed case. The importance, you can't enter into negotiations and land use planning agreements without honoring the outcome. Seems kind of obvious, but the Supreme Court finally made that clear. Raven supported three nations um, all in their effort to get to the Supreme Court and ultimately 75% of the watershed has been protected. Pulled together two, Trans Mountain, which as you all know has had a recent amazing outcome. Some key legal precedents I'd like to point out here. Firstly, the scope of the NEB process and frankly it's a somewhat Orwellian process um, where, which the courts outed, by the way, as a critical error by setting up a process where the NEB could only look at what it wanted to look at and thereby not look at marine shipping and the increase in tanker traffic. Um, and so it also followed that by not applying the Species at Risk Act, the federal government failed its statutory obligation to protect the endangered whales. And then we also have, again, the consultation issue where 
with indigenous peoples, the consultation was supposed to be a meaningful two-way genuine dialogue and it amounted to, as one Squamish elected councillor called it, note-taking. And we supported four nations and are still supporting four nations in that. Heltzik Nation. We're working with Heltzik Nation again. We worked with them on the first Pull Together Against Enbridge campaign, and now we're partnering on a new campaign to support them in the legal action that is part of the fallout of the devastating oil spill of the Nathan E. Stewart that happened almost three years ago. It'll be three years October 13th. And finally, the Tar Sands trial which is, although it's one of our longest running campaigns, we are just about to launch it as sort of a big new campaign. Um, because from a legal perspective, this case is the largest challenge to industry because it encompasses all the cumulative impacts of all the permits that were handed out. And from a fundraising perspective, this is the network to change model in action. The power of the crowd to set a strong, you know, to support the Beaver Lake Cree Nation to set the strongest precedent ever in a Canadian court on something like this. And Beaver Lake Cree Nation will be in court November 26th uh, seeking an advanced cost award. So we are about to bring up our panelists and just before we do, oh and so that's sort of our raven in a nutshell and I'd be happy to talk to any of you about it after. But we now have a short video while we bring our panelists up on stage. drastically changed in our territories. That used to be all pristine boreal forest and it's cleared now and all you see is, you know, husky signs, shell signs. Yeah. When these people came over, they wanted to own the land. We don't believe that. That's why in this treaty, there's no talk about ownership. We believe that the land owns us. We are here just as visitors on this land. So, so we can share it with you. We can't give it to you though. To Alberta now, where there's a growing concern over a toxic spill. Distilled petroleum is still seeping out of the ground after leaks at a site were discovered months ago. Now, the spill is located north of Bonneville, Alberta, near the edge of a restricted military training site. Just in the past little while, like a, a month, there's just been like one spill after the other. You know, when I heard about the spill, I was really hurt, you know, and then I started getting information about, you know, further information about the spill itself and that it was a lot worse than what was being reported um, and that it's actually a lake that's been, uh, been affected. Hi. Hi. My name is Krista Lehman and I'm a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation. I got a report that there was a spill out on the Primrose site. My understanding is that the water was affected. And, and it's not up to me, but if you go over to that building over there, they'll oh. talk to you for sure. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. You guys can't film in here. Okay. You can't. Okay. 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 So, you've heard about CNRL at a spill. spill. I understand you want to go and access. We can do that, but there's a process. Okay. I can't give you access. This is the Beaver Lake Cree Nation traditional hunting territory, and it's I my constitutional I right. It. I respect it. I can't give you access. To be able to go onto my traditional I'm territory. I'm trying to tell you how we're going to get this okay. done. What we want to do is we want to try and facilitate this for you. Okay. But you need to get a hold of Mr. Dick Brinkley, number one. Okay. He's the range activities officer and the First Nations liaison officer for the Canadian Forces at Four Wing Pole Lake. Okay, so both of these people are, are, are at just Four one, Wing. Just one person. Dick I'm Brinkley. sorry. Okay. Did I miss something? I'm sorry. Did I confuse you? No, you didn't confuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Me. I'm throwing out a lot of names and stuff. I know that you know that I have uh, the right to access our territory. Wish I had better news for you, but uh, that's the process. No, eventually that we'll get in there, so, oh, you, will. you know. <laughs> Did I confuse you? That's how he was talking to me. Really? Like I was just some dumb Indian. Here's what I say, she did it right back. 
and um, they don't even know what it is. It's not a pipeline leak. And there's black spots all over the ground, just oozing out of the ground. Our ancestors from Beaver Lake here are buried in the southwest part of that lake. And the spill happened in the southern part of that lake. So. The environment eh? is suffering. Mm. My uncle Al Lehman, he was chief for about 35 years. He started to notice decline in the woodland caribou, which is one of the animals that we subsist on. And it was directly linked to industry. rivers flow and the sun shines, we will always have an inherent right to the land. We will always be able to hunt, fish, and forage the same as we did yesterday, the day before that, and the day before that, and we'll be able to do that tomorrow, the day after that, and the day after that. What makes our lawsuit different than other lawsuits is that we're not taking on one oil company. We're taking on the Canadian government. Some powerful words that lead us into an amazing panel discussion. I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, Adam Olson, M the Green Party MLA for Saanich and North Islands. Aitz kwechel heilat siam na aitz chelicha. It's a hunt up to net sinach. Slea sinach sinach. Slea kwathlap eilat lungs. I am, uh, as uh, Susan said, the MLA for Saanich North in the Islands um, and the territory of the Saanich people. Um, I'm honored to, uh, to be the, the first Kusanich person to um, represent uh, Kusanich, uh, as someone said to me earlier today, uh, in the big boy chair uh, in the legislature. Um, although sometimes it doesn't feel like it's a big boy chair at all. It feels like it's a little kid's chair sometimes. But anyway, um, I'd like to thank, uh, thank Raven for the opportunity to be here this evening and to uh, to, to hang out with some fantastic uh, with some fantastic people and have a conversation about something that I know that we're all uh, passionate about. Uh, also, like to acknowledge uh, that we are uh, here to gathering today in uh, our relatives' territory. Um, the Lekwungen uh, pe speaking people are uh, very closely related to the Kusanich. Uh, just uh, we're just located to the north, and I'd like to raise my hand. I, I get the opportunity to to work in their beautiful territory uh, on a daily basis now, and it's, a, it's an honor to come down here, uh, come down here to do the work. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to thank Rose uh, for your beautiful song, and thank you so much for, for sharing it and being so willing to, uh, to share your passion and your love for uh, the work that you do. It's very important work, Rose, and so I raise my hands to you. Heichka, thank you. Um, so I get uh, the opportunity to hang out with uh, with uh, Dr. John Burroughs. You are a doctor, that's correct, yeah, Dr. John Burroughs. <laughs> and uh, Saul Brown, I'm I'm gonna try your, yeah? Ajispa? Pretty close, pretty What close. is it? Ajispa. Ajispa. We have that same kind of <laughs> sound in yeah, San Jothan right. as well. That's right. So that wasn't the challenge, it was just remembering it. Um, <laughs> it was the challenge. Uh, so let's uh, let's let's start. I don't have bios uh, for you, gentlemen, and so um, why don't we start uh, here with you, Saul? You can uh, let us know who you are and what you do, where you're from, and uh, what you would like to get out f get out of this evening, and uh, we'll keep it short. <laughs> Coming from the elected official. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we wawachtus. <laughs> Dakinyalis Yilkalachle, Dinuakau, Ajipa Klanugua, Glakuguquis, Himas Gladliasila, Klanugua Hilstakla, Kla Mulch Mumps, a house 
new channel thought. Wallace well, guy asked you how to look glue coat. So uh, hello relatives. Hello dear ones, because my parents are in the room and my partner Emily. And hello people from all over. Uh, my name is Ajishpa and I come from the house of Himas Gladly Asila. And that name and responsibility of that chieftainship belongs to my father, who's also in the room. And so that's the precious one, Dinuakau. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to thank the Lekwungen people, the original people of the land, and also thank Raven for holding space. And um, so that's who I am. Um, I'm a Hilstuch, a Noop Chonolf person, and uh, someone who lives this lives indigenous legal principles up in the, what has colloquially become known as the Great Bear Rainforest. Mm. But I simply know it as home. It's the largest and uh, last intact temperate rainforest on planet Earth. No fish farms, no clear cuttings, and we worked really hard as a nation to keep it that way. Um, the most diverse forms of starfish and chitin in the world, so biodiversity is rich and vibrant. And so that's where I come home, call home. So that's where I come from. And out of tonight, I, I just want to have a, a conversation with, with these brilliant minds. Um, and hopefully we can illuminate some, some pathway forward for all of us to walk together, um, not just for indigenous people, indigenous rights, and indigenous responsibilities, for, for humanity, to address some things that affect all of us as humans here on this globe that we all call home. Just how I call my place home, we all call this planet home. And so how do we create a better pathway forward, Adam, is what I'm looking to get out of tonight. It's a beautiful thing, absolutely. Thank you, uh, thank you for that, Saul. And, uh, and uh, it was one of the things, the same teaching that my grandmother gave me, which was to remind everybody that uh, if you're in Sanich, it's your responsibility to look after that place. It's not just the responsibility of the Hulnuk or the the original people there, but it's all of our responsibilities to look after that place because it's all the place that we call home. Dr. Burroughs, maybe the same questions, the same uh, set of criteria for you, sir. You can let us know who you are and where you're from and what you'd like to get out of this evening. Hello, my relatives. Uh, my name is Giganos, which is my third great-grandfather's name, and I'm from the Otter clan of the Neashi Wenigaming, or the Portage uh, Point people, which is the Cape Croker Indian Reserve on the shores of Georgian Bay, about four hours north of Toronto on the Saugeen Peninsula. I want to express my appreciation for you being here this evening, your curiosity and interest and questions is what motivates me. I feel like I'm a student and there's so much to be able to learn when we interact together. And I just had the best day of law school in my 31 years today because we had a course out at the Wissanich Tribal School and uh, Mavis Underwood spoke to us and she shared a powerful life story about how Wissanich law has lived through her and around her. And I've been from coast to coast to coast in Canada and across the oceans, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, other places in the world. I've never heard a finer presentation of indigenous law than I did today. Uh, powerful people live in these territories and I'm grateful that we can learn from them. And we've been in this field school the last couple of weeks and I also recognize our teachers are the waters and the winds and the trees, the otters and the beautiful winds that surround us. And uh, I'm looking forward to continuing to be a student this evening and learning from you and perhaps reflecting back a thing or two of what I've learned on some of the journeys I've been a part of. Miigwech. Thank you. Uh, three, uh, three individuals from three different parts of the world all that are certain, I'm sure, that that's the center of the universe. <laughs> uh, it's, the teaching, uh, it's the teaching that we've been given, is that it's the center of the universe. And you know, I think as long as we're all treating the world, part of the world that we live in, or the part of the world that we're from, as the center of the universe, 
then we all have a different and um, special relationship with that place. And you can see and hear the passion uh, from from John and from Saul about uh, just how uh, that place means what it means to them to be able to proudly say that that's uh, where we're from. Um, we were given a very open slate here for the next uh, number of minutes. Uh, and um, so I want to read something. It's basically kind of like taking the ball and throwing it in the air and figuring out what happens after. after. But uh, it's a speech that was delivered on September the 13th from our uh, Minister of Justice and Attorney General, the Federal Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Jody, well, Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould um, from here on, on Vancouver Island, the first... Uh, Indigenous uh, Minister of Justice, but I want to read these words um, and then we'll see what happens. Words in the work of reconciliation are also cheap without real action. Action that goes to the core of undoing the colonial laws, policies, and practices, and that is based on the real meaning of reconciliation. We all need to understand this. The path of justice and equality is not advanced or achieved through half measures, good intentions, or lofty rhetoric. And it is certainly not achieved through obfuscation or confusion about what we mean when we speak. Hard choices, innovative actions, transformations in laws and policies, new understandings and attitudes, new patterns of behavior. This is what is needed. Now, I can imagine that there are probably some government lawyers going, hmm, that's interesting. But powerful words spoken by a powerful indigenous leader and words that I think we need now more than ever. Is anybody going to pick up that ball and, and run with it? So I'll there start. It yeah, nice. You know, there's no reconciliation with one another until there's reconciliation with the earth and until we build our societies in an understanding that uh, the citizens that surround us are the ants and the fish and the creatures that fly in the air uh, we don't have a proper sense of our constitution we are constituted in relation to those beings and to the things that they allow us to do in this world. And so when Jody speaks um, those words, I think it's a challenge to traditional or conventional ways of practicing law that often regard uh, the earth and what's living as an object and not as a subject and see a constitution as a, a thing or a noun rather than a verb, that is, we constitute ourselves, we are constituting, and that constitution is in relationship with not just one another, but that source of life that's around us. This past week, I've had an opportunity to be at a pit cook in your territory, and JB uh, told us the stories of um, life as it comes out of that water, as the Wisanich are the emerging people. And uh, the, the story there is a significant story because it recognizes that the islands are your relatives. And when we see islands and rocks as part of who we are, we understand our constitution better and then we practice our constitution better. So we've had Belinda Elliott, one of the elders from your community, taking us to clam sites and uh, transformer sites and as she tells the story she's talking about how law is written in the earth and the way that we measure our lives our standards our principles our criteria for making judgments need to flow from those points and that's not happening by and large in the larger legal system and so Jody's talk there is a call to shake up those structures that just see law as only flowing from courts and parliaments and legislatures. Of course, it does flow from courts and parliaments and legislatures, but not only there. And part of our great challenge is to ensure that we channel and understand what the earth is telling us so that we can speak that into the courts. 
and speak that into the legislatures and the parliaments. Gaesika, John, um, I want to address the word. Um, so, John, I agree ev with everything you're saying. I want to address the word reconciliation. And uh, we do have to reconcile with the earth. And for me, I'm going to tell you a story about what I do. And I'm a negotiator for the, my nation back home. And we are involved in reconciliation negotiations. And I had to go tell my grandma, my uncle, my aunts, my little cousins in the school what reconciliation is and what we're doing. And we couldn't. It was just too convoluted. People would either tie it to the 2004 court case where it said Section 35, one of the Constitution is reconciliation through the Haida case, or they'd say it's the TRC and it's run residential schools and they'd get triggered and there's trauma. Or you could take a university course on it, or it's the year of reconciliation. So it's discursive is what I'm saying. It would digress from subject to subject, often fitting the agenda of the person who was speaking it. And so what we said is, we're going to leave that word, and we're going to go to our own word. And our word is ikhtiltut, and it's a potlatch term. And our potlatch is our form of governance. It's where our laws, which you spoke of, John, have life and have validity. And that's where they flow from and are validated and affirmed in a human sense. Because they, they're going to be validated and affirmed in their own way anyways, a natural law, but there's other human ways to affirm laws. And so we went to this word. And it's also, there, an old elder too, one time we were in council chambers, he said, oh, that word, what you're saying, it means when a boat flips over, you take it to the beach and you flip it back over and you make it right again. And I said, hey, that works too. That's two definitions now. <laughs> and so we said to make something right because we didn't do anything wrong as indigenous people. And that's what, that's what we had to say is like, well, what are we reconciling? Are we reconciling ourselves to a bad situation or the Canadian state of asserted sovereignty? of assertive oppression, of all these things that have been pretty negative. So we say, no, well, let's talk about reconciliation from our point of view. And I think that's what she's getting at, is there's a whole bunch of work that has to happen to undo the, the, the negative policies and laws and the stereotypes in the media, which uh, what they perpetuate. But there's also this other thing is, let's ask indigenous nations, what is reconciliation? And, and wh what, is, what does that mean? And so that's the word we came up with, we listen to our strength. And we want to, because we're not just decolonizing, it's not just a plain slate, we have thousands of years from our homelands, that richness from those stories, those laws, like you spoke about, the pit cooks, and those inform reconciliation. And so I think that word is, she's talking about undoing some of that, the, the colonial era that has constricted us, but there's also a beautiful solution there once that unstricting happens, and maybe it's, it's a little bit of both, you know, it happens on parallel streams, but, you know, there's other words there that we can use in terms of reconciliation that I think from in home, in community, that when I say to now my grandmother or the little kids, they know what we're talking about. It's, it's a little more specific and it, it breathes more life into it. Well, no, I, that's beautiful. And I just came from Winnipeg where I was at the 10th uh, uh, anniversary of the circle on philanthropy and, and Aboriginal peoples in Canada and uh, there was much discussion around that and around um, people get locked into words one word can you know and and somehow they it pigeonholes an idea and then people have trouble moving out of it um, so I, I hesitate to take us out of this conversation but I have Chris Archie um, she Chris Archie who is the executive director of this uh, Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada was originally also going to be part of this panel and be here in person, but she is in Yellowknife, and so I had a brief conversation with her that we videotaped, and she has a bunch of questions right at the end that she threw at you guys, so I think now would be a good time to play it, and then we can, and because she brings um, this really rich perspective. Awesome. Okay, so let's hear what she has yeah. to say. I'm sort of there because we couldn't figure out another way to record it, but <laughs> it's it's all her talking. And we're recording. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Susan. Wake me, wake. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Archie, and I'm Northern Sequatin de Gelmo from Central BC. The feds call my community Canham Lake Indian Reserve Number 5, 
I call it home, and we also call it Seskin, which means broken rock. That's the community that my mom comes from. My dad is a fourth fourth generation settler here to Canada. And I'm joining you today from a hotel room in the Dene Da territory here, way north in Yellowknife. So I'm just so thrilled that I could uh, pop in just to say a few words. Uh, I'm the executive director for the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada. We are a member-based organization, and we work to bring Indigenous-led and Indigenous-informed charitable organizations into better relationship with settler-based philanthropic organizations. And I was really struck by the invitation to join you all um, to be part of a conversation that is about courageous conversation, because I believe that courage and bravery aren't they aren't, um, you know, attributes that we're born with, but I view them more like muscles that we need to work them. We need to exercise them um, like we do any other muscle. And so I just am really excited to know that you're all joined together, um, getting ready to do some heavy lifting tonight through conversation and through deep listening. I want to... Um, tell you a little bit about some of the work we're doing with settler created philanthropic organizations. Um, we define settler created philanthropic groups as those who have generated their wealth and or endowments on the lands and the backs of indigenous peoples. Um, and we work with them primarily through invitation, really wanting to promote the notion that there is a journey toward being in a different kind of relationship. Um, but the thing about that journey is, um, I like to use images, and so I want you all to imagine uh, a big river kind of floating through the center of the room, and across that river, there is a series of stones, and if you make the right leap at the right time, that you um, might be able to get across and get to the other side on that river, and so the pathway toward um, being in better relationship together is kind of like a river. And we need to jump across these stones. They're like stepping stones from one place to the other. And when you do this work well, there's no way you get across the first time without getting wet or getting muddy um, or just like ending up down the creek, uh, likely without a paddle. Um, I think that one of, the, one of the benefits to imagining it like this is to know that there is a, a place down the road. There's a place ahead of us. We can't always see exactly how we'll get there, but we have to have some faith. We must make some leaps. And the, the stepping stones for us are focused around these four um, spheres of influence. And the first is about um, your personal sphere of influence. How is it that you are in right relationship to yourself and to your creator? Um, the second is really focused on family. How is it that you're in right relationship to the connection you have with your family and the, and the history of your ancestors um, and how they are um, currently complicit or have been complicit in the past in the harms caused um, to Indigenous peoples in this country. The third is really about being deeply in community and understanding the places where you live and work and play and recognizing the responsibility to be in good, strong community with one another. And finally, that kind of final leap that we invite folks to think about is how they might then, when they've built up some of these muscles to work in spaces and to have uncomfortable conversations and to push against what is not talked about or push against what is just led to be uh, or believed to be true, that um, you could then go into your workplaces uh, into your spheres of volunteerism or vocation or profession and begin to establish how you can be a champion on this pathway to build different kinds of relationships. I have a whole slew of questions that if I was there, I would love to ask and questions I would love to answer and to hear other people's answers on. And so I'll just leave you with a couple of them um, for, for this and maybe for future ones. And uh, hopefully I can be in person, those ones. Um, one question that sits with me is, um, what scares settlers about the actualization of Indigenous laws? And the next is really, what is the beauty and the possibility for all Canadians if we actualize Indigenous laws and hold them up? How could we decenter whiteness in the work of climate justice? 
I think that that's a, an important question that we must continue to answer and, and work, and it requires of us to work differently. And then this one, I think, is a question for us in our, in our days. Um, what is the work we need to do so that we might get into right relationship to our creator, to our families, to be in our community, and to um, steward transformation from inside of our vocational and professional settings? So uh, with that, I would just like to invite that folks really embody this sense of curiosity of their head, that they really pay attention to and connect with their heart and with their values about the things that matter, um, and that you, you think about how this conversation moves you towards action um, and or moves you towards a, a recognition for the things that you must stop doing to create space and opportunity for others. Thank you so much. I so wish that I could be there with you all tonight um, and just really look forward to hearing about how it went and seeing on the, on the Twitterverse um, all of the wonderful things that will be said. And um, just thank you for this opportunity to share briefly. Cook Shem. So much, Chris. And uh, your questions will resonate this evening. So I'll talk to you again soon. Great. Thank you so much. There and good uh, conversations on the Twitterverse, but... Um, <laughs> my experience in the Twitter versus a different one than that, but nonetheless, um, they're they're fantastic questions. And one of the things uh, that comes out of it, uh, it comes out of it for me, in in terms of the context of courageous conversations, uh, was one of the first times that I stood in the legislature and spoke Senchothan, and it was the first time in the legislature that those words uh, had been heard. Uh, and I remember uh, Hansard. Uh, I was sharing this earlier, Hansard kind of, you know, freaking out and as they're trying to, uh, as they're trying to transcribe these words that I was pronouncing poorly and, and that are from an alphabet that we, that you have to download or a, 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 a keyboard that you have to download in an alphabet that you can't, you don't see. And it, you know, it was, it w was a bit of chaos there in Hansard for a little bit. Uh, and, and I just continued to do it. I just continued to, to drop words in, words that uh, that better describe the ideas that were trying to be said, or uh, that I would use as a as a way to disrupt uh, the the co the common flow of the place. Drop a word, and people would kind of wake up uh, from their seats and look around, and and maybe pass back out again. But nonetheless, they'd wake up for that brief moment, and and uh, and eventually. Uh, Hansard stopped asking us about the words that I was using, and we started to notice that they were they'd found the Senchothan word list online and were were becoming proficient <laughs> at finding the word and 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 then using the they downloaded the keyboard and it's in it's in uh, it's in the Hansard text now and uh, I ran into a couple of people who you don't see because they're in these dark rooms and they came up and they said, you know, it was fascinating the challenge that you posed to us by speaking your language in the legislature. And, uh, and I think now that we've got the Senchothan Dictionary, it's 5,000 plus words, I think that they des they've earned one now. And, and I think now it's time for me to buy them a, a Senchothan Dictionary to put for their very own use. I intend to continue using it, but I think that part of these courageous conversations that, that we're talking about and the road to reconciliation, this journey, part of the journey that I've been on is to stand up and, and to speak the language in a place that, that's not really comfortable with it, frankly. It, it's becoming more comfortable. Um, but, uh, you know, so what are the, the, uh, the times in your lives that you've been challenged, I guess, with those opportunities to stand up and to, and to be courageous in the things that you were saying when you know that perhaps, you know, to the point, I think of the first question, uh, you know, the system that you're working in or the, the institution that you're working in is not really quite ready for you yet. <laughs> so the challenges that we face, we've talked about a bit, but there's a worry that if Indigenous law is recognized, that the control can no longer be as centralized around decision making because if it's just the courts or only parliament or the legislatures, there's always a possibility that someone can come along and um, corner those decision makers or create incentives for those decision makers that um, 
take them on a path that doesn't necessarily connect with other people. And so my experience of indigenous law is that it diffuses authority, uh, puts it back in place, the places that we're from and the families that we're a part of, and that's a part of our language as well. Our languages are place-based. They're the sounds of the ecologies of the locations that we're a part of. And in my language, it's 80% verbs. So when you speak, it's about action. And it's about an understanding that that action requires the engagement of a whole bunch of people, not just a few decision makers. And so that's maybe what's a little bit scary about Indigenous law. It requires the diffusion of decision making, but that's also the beauty of Indigenous law because it does require the diffusion of decision making. It means that it's more democratic. It allows us to be able to speak our minds and practice our opportunities and our obligations and recognizes that we're not always just in consensus. Indigenous law is also about dealing with the conflicts that we have, but we have ways of dealing with that. You mentioned the potlatch, an amazing system that brings people together, but also allows us to identify when there's challenges and to work through those challenges. So the strength is uh, maybe for some the weakness, uh, but for me, it's a verb, it's the living nature of the way that people uh, can be involved in their relationships with one another in the earth. So for this one, I often uh, reflect back to the words of Chief Bobby Joe, um, Robert Joseph, our Kwakula relative, and he says, reconciliation isn't for cowards. And uh, I think what he means by that is this work is hard, so... Wallace Guy Asica, to all of you for coming out to try something new. Because often when we try something new, we get afraid. I know this happens to me. We get, we get fearful and we fall back to what we know because that's not new. But what we know as a community and as a Canada, what we know it isn't working. And actually we, we know it's pretty harmful to indigenous people. And so as we move through, I really appreciate Chris's um, analogy of the four rocks, you know, as we hop, hop through. I think of it like charting a course. Mm -hmm. So we could only do what we can envision. We could only do what we can draw back, draw out from the past, our, our deep, beautiful, complex, comprehensive legal systems and bring into the future. And that's what we can do. But we got to be able to envision that. And as we envision that, as we move forward, we got to be careful not to fall back onto what we know because then that's going to be that harmful stuff again. And I think that's just like a trait that most people do. We're fearful of the unknown. And so we got to chart this path, not for us, because it's going to be tough. We're going to get muddy. We're going to get wet just trying to cross that river, but for future generations because it's incumbent on us to do that for them. And I think that's part of our legal system is to, to account for that to account for those generations to come, to give them the inheritance of a bountiful sea, of a wealthy land. And so I think that's part of what I think when Bobby Joe says it's not for cowards. We got to be strong-minded in this work. And that strong mind is another legal principle in ours, to have that, that mental fortitude to forge ahead in this work. And so to move forward and beyond that, I think that, that challenge, if we'll, oh, I'd be challenged if we're all in this challenge right now. Collectively, we're in this conscious space where like, it's a time for change. So let's change. But let's not be scared while we do it. Let's relinquish fear from our hearts as we move forward so we don't fall back onto that harmful, old, reproductive pattern of, of being, um, yeah, just being harmful. Thank you. Um, I remember standing in the legislative library, this grand, as these buildings are, these, this grand room, marble everywhere, and former Le Lieutenant Governor Judith Gishon um, giving her final, giving her final speech to uh, the MLAs and some of the, s the senior staff and talking about reconciliation and the action behind it. And uh, living and working in the political sphere, I often feel that we as, as, as politicians uh, at, at all levels want to reconcile on behalf of our constituents, on behalf of our communities and our people. 
And I think that we've seen some examples of this recently, but really sort of charting a course for or creating an environment, I'll put it that way, for people. And, and I think that we're looking at a room here and, and probably online of people that are already on their own journey of reconciliation and that we feel that we have to be all together in the same place. But yet reconciliation is something that our society is going through, but it's also a personal, it's a personal journey. Um, and, and, and to the point that you were making, John, around um, it becoming decentralized, m more fragmented than perhaps the, the current legal system likes it to be, where it, everything is in a, in a tight box, but every single person here is it on, in their own, on their own journey. And that was what I think, you know, what I think that we, and, and at the political level and maybe at the legal level, you can speak more to that, uh, we need to learn how to do, and that's create an environment and foster a scenarios where people engage that journey yeah, on their own. That's right. So when we talk about diffusion, that's not uh, necessarily confusion because we need to coordinate together and coordination occurs through patterns, right? And so we need to find what those patterns are in the natural world around us and analogize those to our behavior. And when we do that, we, and at least in Anishinaabemowin, see some interesting correlation. So, for instance, our word for love is zagi. Our word for river mouth is zagin. So if you want to know how to love, you learn that from the mouth of a river. What goes on at the mouth of a river? All these nutrients are delivered, sometimes from thousands of miles, deposited in that place, which creates a richness of sustenance for first the little insects, and then the fish that come along and feast on those insects, and then the birds that are there feasting on the fish and the insects, then the animals that are part of that. And before you know it, people are a part of that relationship. So in other words, the mouth of a river is a place of rich sustenance, diversity of the forms of life, uh, interflow between what goes out and what comes back in. So love should be delivering energy in defined channels with opportunity for the richness of our natural world to be filtered uh, through us. That is the pattern of love, but it's a pattern of law for Anishinaabe folks to say, as long as the river flows, right, that's the treaty promise, as long as we keep delivering what the river teaches us that we need to be doing, our treaties will be healthy and strong and our relationship will be healthy and strong. Truth, these are our seven grandmother and grandfather teachings. Zagiduin is love. Truth, debuewin, a measure of sound. What I know from my experience. Your notion of debuewin is your measure of sound. When we join that sound together, there's an opportunity for us to think about harmonies. You know, I don't have to play the same note as you, but when the notes are played in a proper way, there's something that emerges from that that's a pattern of law, de buewen, or courage. Zung dewen, ode is the heart. Zung is strength. Where do we learn that again? Ode is related to the fire, ishkode. Right? We learn about strength by looking at what it takes to keep a fire, to make sure that it doesn't rage out of control, but also to make sure it doesn't die, that we're selecting the fuel we add to that fire. These laws, love, courage, truth, they're the patterns that we're taught by the natural world around us. And if we take them into our human community, we find ways to answer these questions. And I think one of the things that Chris was, when I was speaking to her before we were recording is exactly that, that she would really like, because in many ways, I, Possibly this is preaching to the converted, uh, but the idea of having this conversation is, so at Thanksgiving, when we're all sitting at dinner, how do we, how do we get the, the love through to, you know, Uncle Stanley or Auntie Joan, who says the 
off the wall thing that's harmful or hurtful. And w as you said, we're on our individual path, and and so you know you're sitting there as that one person at the table going, so <laughs> about that comment, you know, that's that's not helpful. But then you you don't want to alienate the family. You want to bring them into the conversation. You want it, you know, not to be note taking like like the they noted for the consultation. You know, you want it to be inclusive and two way and genuine. So how do we get there, right? Like how do we how do we raise the level of discourse so that people can do that. I just think that there's such a, uh, a great teaching in our, in so many of our elders that were so patient. Um, through the time of, of residential schools and through the time, like really, really tough times, like these languages that, that we hear, the languages that we're here being, s the words that we're being, that are being spoken up here tonight very powerfully unlock a worldview that, um, that I think help all of us understand the world around us in a in a much more complex and compre comprehensive way, and I think that that the teaching it's almost a silent teaching that that I can see from my elders, and that is uh, one of one of a tremendous amount of patience and compassion that they don't understand it, a and yes, they're hurting us in this way right now, but. We just need to we just need to continue to be strong uh, to the point that Saul made. Be strong, uh, and that teaching is so is is so important. And and our languages went through such a, a tremendous. They took a beating, an absolute beating, and yet here we are speaking them. And 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 to whatever to whatever level we can, uh, it w with the certain amount of power that we have behind them. But it's but it's teaching everybody here and and everybody that hears indigenous languages and giving it so much more breadth and depth uh, to our to our culture and our society as a whole. Do you have anything there, so? Yeah. So for for that uncle, that practical that practical skill too, and to build off this point, I remember talking to my grandmother who who went to residential school and. And uh, you know she she experienced the, the horrors, right? The, the reservation nightmares still haunt her of this awful experience, and uh, we don't have to get into that. But what she said was, "I still pray for those people. I still pray for those people." And to me, that epitomizes <laughs> that epitomizes reconciliation because even though all those atrocities and all that abuse was done onto her, she still has the ability and the compassion, mm. the love. To rise above. So even though that person, that off the wall person, is is saying these things, um, we have to be mindful that you know th we got to recognize them just how we have to recognize all animate beings that you know they're still they they're human. There's humanity there, and if there's humanity there and there's life there, then how do we nurture that in in a way that's conducive to our worldview? Because your worldview is different than mine, different than John's, different than Susan's. So how do we what's conducive to that? And let's go to that rich worldview that we come from and find those practical lessons within it to address that. If I could just say, when I hopefully find myself in those conversations, I want to learn. Because I'm maybe not quite sure of all that's being said in that conversation as I hear it. And so I want to be open to the possibility that there's something in my framing or hearing that's partial, and not just a jump to a conclusion, but have a conversation and not feel like I need to immediately jump back with an answer. And uh, the, the, the idea of nuance being sacred is something we often lose in the Twitterverse or the peeling things off into oppositional dichotomous points of view. Of course, there's right and wrong. And of course, things can be opposite from one another. But there's so much space in between that we often miss because we jump to trying to give an answer rather than having a listening opportunity to take that day boy when the measure of sound the gift that someone gives us when they raise a hard question and then think about that and try to engage rather than just kind of preach or talk over uh, that person you know what's you know what's fascinating is uh, I've now been through two going into my third session or technically it will be my fourth session of the legislature and never, w and we've made some laws, uh, some good ones and some not so good ones, but never did we stand up and talk about laws and, it, and attach the word love. 
to it. Yeah. Or courage. <laughs> or courage. But I, I think, you know, like, I don't know if there's any more to add to this, but I, th I think actually where we stand right now in, in our society, one of the things that indigenous cultures in our, in, in our province and in our country can share with the world is there's a tremendous amount of love in the laws that, that run our societies that we're a part of. And you've talked about it with the river. Any, anything come to mind in terms of the, the love that comes out of the Heltic territory? I'll put you on the spot here, but yeah, yeah, for sure. So, like, I want to, you know, just draw it back into like, you know, love. There is love, and that's amazing. But there's also there's the real practical issue. If there's not love there, the absence of love, we're talking about species at risk. We're talking about things that uh, kids aren't going to eat, freezers aren't going to get filled. You know, that we're talking about elders going hungry because that's our breadbasket. That's how we get what we need to sustain ourselves. We still live off the land. You can't drive to where I come from. It's flying, ferrying. And so um, those ideals are beautiful, and that's everything we need to do. But the absence of love or the inaction on part of reconciliation has dire consequences. And so when we take that into account, there's no other choice but to love, to find that out, to, to seek that out and with whichever world that you come from because the absence of that is, is, can be very destructive to the natural world and to people who live so intimately to the natural world, the hunters, the fishermen, the hailstone. And we had talked earlier before we convened about this idea, and John, you were really taken with this, the idea of lateral kindness. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could speak to that because yeah. I, I think that's important. That yeah, so the notion of lateral kindness is a recognition that we all have the capacity to find goodness in one another and encourage that. And I see that uh, in the classrooms that I'm a part of. Uh, I see that when I'm in the Wissanich community or my community. But I also see that in many walks of life. It's easy to be cynical, and we need to be cynical, it's easy to be critical, and we need to be critical, but that's not the only story, right? Beware the danger of a single story, and part of the story of Canada is the horrors that we understand, but it's also the kindness that we continue to see. And if we don't embrace that, and we just always pick up the negative, um, we're not able to practice that lateral kindness, which is so important to to our world around us. We've got some questions coming in, which is pretty exciting, and I love this idea, and I think this might build on it, this question. So this first question is, in day-to-day -day courageous conversations, whose voice is not being heard, and how can we ensure they are heard? I'm speaking a lot, but if I can just take the start of this. I was on Salt Spring Island the other day at the mouth of Fulford Harbor, and we were with the students getting ready to camp on your reserve there at that mouth. And, and, in, and in my riding, too. Actually. And in your riding, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a beautiful setting, and I was going to set my tent up in the deep loam of the earth as the pebbles kind of transition to the forest. And I had my tent actually set up there. And then I sniffed, and I, I looked around, and I thought, this isn't right. I, I can smell otters here. Um, there's something that I need to respect. And so, you know, this is my clan. These are my people. And so I moved back further into the forest and cleared another area that was likewise really beautiful and soft. And there was a lot of boat traffic and chop as 9 o'clock was rolling around. I was getting ready for bed. The ferry's going back and forth. But at 10 o'clock, it got really quiet, calm, bizon as we say in Anishinaabemwin. And I fell asleep. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, I was woken up by the beautiful voices of otters singing right out in front of me on that shore. So the question is, whose voices are not being heard? Right? The otters. <laughs> and, the, and the other, you know, we're, we, we shut them out with the way we block ourselves in houses or the boat traffic disturbs them and how can we ensure that they are heard by putting yourself in a position where you 
are in their environment and they then can speak to you and that requires action right that requires getting out and uh, taking in the beauty of what surrounds us I'm going to I'm going to build off that because uh, up until this summer I would say that the this the story or the voices of the Kaltholomachin uh, in our in our area here the killer whales um, the orcas had not been heard but um, I, I think at least one uh, of the matriarchs in the uh, in in J Pod found a way to communicate uh, this summer with us in a in a way that in in a in a way that I think that we understand and and one in fact that frankly made my summer very difficult in in just recognizing that there is uh, there there's another story that's being told here and one that one that I think for the first time kind of broke through. The the gadgets and the and the the digital the the Twitterverse and the it broke through to this really kind of th there was a lot of people that hurt really bad because they saw uh, Taliqua and her calf a and and they just they just felt the pain of of that in a in a really visceral kind of way and you know I remember my uncle John telling the story of. One of our one of our ancestors, a, a late aunt of ours, that um, used to be able to speak to those um, the, to our relatives, the Kaltholomachin, and took her sons out. Uh, they were fishermen, uh, fishing family, and uh, and would we would take our family out and introduce them to our relatives, the whales. And and there's this common story um, in Saanich that it's always if if you look after them they will look after you and that's the contract in Saanich territory is if you're doing your job you're looking after them and then they if they're doing their job from the creator they'll be looking after you and so you know, I just wanted to build on that a little bit because I think that the voices that haven't been heard and I'm starting to be heard now are uh, are those whales and the other uh, animals around us um, just to keep building on that, we had the Nathan E. Stewart spill that we're actually fundraising for as a nation for our legal fees. And um, when that happened, I remember like it was just it was tragic. It was devastating. It was like you physically felt ill. And I remember I called my Gaia, uh, my dad's uncle, and and everyone was worried about about you know whether it was otters or killer whales or herring or salmon all these things that we know in the natural world and it was this my you know my grandfather essentially going into his 80s said what about Tlatla that's Tlatla's homelands and Tlatla you guys would probably know him as Sasquatch or or some other name Yeti whatever it may be and so the supernatural beings um, which in our stories communicated with us as well and a lot of our creation stories talk about supernatural beings, and they're real. They're real to us. Um, and so and it took him to really shift my mind to think about, um, you know, Tlaxla's voice. Who's going to talk for this supernatural being? And he's probably the king of hide and seek, some people say. So <laughs> if you can't find him, who's going to speak for him, so to speak, right? And then the undersea kingdom, right? The king of the undersea kingdom, the uh, sea serpent. A story right in front of that oil spill and so there's there's those voices that are carried through our new yum when we noosa when we tell these stories and so that's the you know the transfer of knowledge intergenerationally and that's how those voices are carried but I think you know to ensure they're heard is is to to take those stories and to view them as valid as real as law We've got three more questions here. Those are great insights. I would also interject that my father was a settler, but he taught me from the very early age that every piece of wood has a story because he was a craftsman and he dealt with wood. And every piece of wood has a story. You have to get quiet to hear it. Um, so we have a, a question here. 
all land use decisions in the CRD outside of the reserves are made by municipal councils and the CRD board, which is more than 90% of the area of the CRD. First Nations are excluded. How can that gulf be bridged? Okay. <laughs> the former municipal councillor. Um, look, I mean, I think, uh, I think the... It's painfully slow, but there has been there has been change. There has been uh, relationships that are starting uh, that are starting to evolve. And I, I think going back to the point that that John made uh, around diffusion of power, this is the thing that the that the CRD and and frankly, this is the thing that the the provincial government hasn't given the mechanism to to really give up. I mean. If you take a look at the the more urban treaties that have been in the mix, it's like the the province and the and the municipalities go, "Oh, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do because they can't consider a different way of governing a place than the way that has evolved to what we're at right now." And then, frankly, from my my perspective, there's nothing sacred about the governance that we have right now. It's not perfect. It's not amazing. It, it, it delivers for some people some of the time. It doesn't deliver for all of the people all of the time, that's for sure. So, um, but, but we protect it and we guard it and we defend it like, like it's the most perfect, sacred thing of all. So I think that once we recognize that these stories that are being told about the relationships with the world around us can actually improve how we govern the communities that we live in and that uh, we we give up this need to control everything the way that it's always been um, and it's it's starting to happen and and frankly it, in the, in the CRD groups like the Saanich leadership council are starting to emerge where first nations are the first nations are coming together and and they are gaining in their own voice power and strength together uh, the uh, the divide and conquer techniques of governments to keep First Nations apart, the reserves, keep them apart, keep them at, keep them at each other, means that they're not at us, right? So that I think uh, th that's not a direct answer because it's been a battle that I know that the chiefs and councils in my riding and around the region have been asking for decision-making authority at the table and the ability to sit at the table, and you know the the conversations that happen behind closed doors are not ones that I think any of us in this room or necessarily other rooms would be very proud of, frankly. Got a couple more questions here, and these are wide ranging. I'll tell you, these are just great. Um, so this one is address and accept truth first, then we can address reconciliation. Reconciliation must go out of grow out of truth. So discuss whether truth is possible, and if so. How? If I can take that question and link it back to the last question, one of the truths of Canadian law is that Aboriginal and treaty rights are constitutionalized, which means they are the highest law in the land, in the Canadian formal legal system. And sometimes when municipalities and provincial governments act in relationship to First Nations burial sites or sacred sites or resource uh, relationships, that's an infringement of those Aboriginal or treaty rights. And the truth is, if that's an infringement, it has to give way. It cannot occur unless it's justified with a very high standard on the part of those provincial or municipal governments that are taking those steps. And I think we sometimes fail to recognize that Aboriginal and treaty rights are the highest law in Canada, not just from Indigenous people's laws and perspective, but in fact also our formal system as well. And that truth gets overridden too quickly um, by just thinking that, the, well, the municipal government has that power or the provincial government has that power when it's actually not properly correlated with our constitutional system. Right? We are constituted in such a way that recognizes, again, you can't extinguish Aboriginal rights. And you can only infringe them if you meet a high, high standard. And we saw that with the recent pipeline decision about the scope of the review and the inappropriate way that that review took place by just taking notes and not really taking seriously the highest standards of Canadian law 
let alone the standards of Tsleil-Waututh or other laws that are in this place? Yeah, for me, is truth possible? And I think uh, absolutely. Um, and I'm a believer in that. And I think it all goes around to land and everything centers around the land and around the, around the water because existence literally comes from the land and water. So when I say it's all about the land, it's all about the water, and people say what? And I say existence. Existence. And so I think that um, whether you're doing a modern day treaty through Nishka law or you're looking at different multi jurisdictional areas over Anishinaabeg lands or you're um, asserting historic treaties in Salish territory or you're negotiating reconciliation agreements on certain parcels of land and not on others, it takes many forms. But I'm a true believer in that um, it's going to be the nation led to assert land ownership, water ownership. And so I think that's a truth, and that's part of reconciliation, is that hard question of land, because it's still outstanding, and you know, not to skirt around it, but I think that's what that, that gets to, is the truth, and that's the existence. So the existence is, yeah, we, some of us do live on you know, occupied lands, and some of us are occupying space in, in lands that maybe we shouldn't be, right? Maybe they're sacred areas. And so I think that, but I'm a believer that we can, and I think all of you in this room are testament to that. Because all of you in this room have come here to try and do better, to have these conversations that are courageous. And I think that's the biggest elephant in the room that no one has said, is the land, is the water, and the ownership and title, right? And I think that's one thing that Indigenous law really allows for, is that title to be worked out in a mechanism that stays true to the title, uh, the, the laws of the land of that title, of, those, of the people who are closest to it. So yes. And, and don't forget all of the people that are watching Yes, yes. yes. They're, they're yeah. true testament to it as well. I want to take a I want to take a because I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I also I want to tweak this a little bit because uh, I've said at, at forums that I've been at that I represent 50,000 differences of opinion. <laughs> so so there is a truth and, 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 and this is this is not to diminish what was just said uh, in any way. I, I don't want it to be perceived that way. But I think that from a, from a politician's perspective in trying to figure out, okay, how do we advance this? The first thing, the first truth that I come upon is that I, have a, I represent a whole pile of, like four different uh, differences of opinion just under the one roof. Like my daughter, Ella, is six. She's got her own opinions. And she shares them with me all the time <laughs> about whether or not I'm... But, the, but I, th I think that from a, from a political perspective, I would just add that, pers that perspective to it that as, as community leaders are, tr are working with the community to, to uh, bring out that truth, we have to be careful in, in that we make the assumption that, oh, we, we'll just do that, like back to the, uh, that point I made earlier, we'll just do it on the behalf and everything will be fine. It actually has a, a real danger of pulling us back and undermining the work that we're actually trying to do as well. So um, it's important to be cognizant of that. Yep. We also have to be cognizant of time, unfortunately. And we're down to 10 minutes, and we've got a bunch of questions that I don't think we're going to have time for because we have another video and some wrap-up. But I will – I'm just going to read the question out. Isn't Sue's doing a great job of taking over I the know. moderator Sorry, position? Sorry, I just took over. <laughs> I, <just laughs> took over I got a card saying you've got a 12 minute and that was two minutes ago. So the, the question here, oh, don't worry about that, was um, I'm interested in hearing more about Indigenous law. I don't know what it is or how it could intersect with Canadian settler law and what the result might be. That's one question. And then this came in right on the back of that is if we have uh, Indigenous laws can open up spaces for love and healing for and is it important to enter these spaces? And what would you say to those who are skeptical, afraid to enter these spaces? So. Can each of you answer that in about 10 seconds? <laughs> I'm, I'm Because <laughs> that's not a huge question. I'm going to go. Maybe that's fodder for our next one because, and then yeah. we'll go to the Janet Rogers video. I'm going to go very quickly. I wear this, I, I'm, I was given this pin. It's got a mace on it. And, and John and I were having this conversation after the indigenous law uh, event at, uh, and launch at UVic that the legislature is run and the authority in the legislature is run through a series of protocols and rituals and the, the similarity that I see between that and the Kusanich is that our law is run through and the authority is derived by a series of very important rituals and ceremonies and in some cases th uh, their symbols such as the mace are, 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 are used in some cases different hats are worn um, and, and so 
what's very interesting is the similarities, as I've noted them, between the most sacred ceremonies that happen in our communities and the most important ceremonies that happen for the rule of law and the governance of a place and how authority is derived. Not too different. It's human in the end, and it's how we organize ourselves and it's how we govern ourselves. So I just wanted, that's the kick that I'll take at that. Great. Great. So Indigenous law are the principles, criteria, measures, standards for making judgments as to how we regulate our lives resolve our disputes, and those come from the sacred, the environment, how we deliberate and talk with one another, the rules that we have, the customs that are a part of our society, and people can participate in them. The invitation, though, has to be extended to you by the people that you're with, and when that occurs, then you can find a range of possibilities again around the criteria, standards, principles, authorities, precedent that are part of the patterns of life in uh, the particular nations. Be the kind of person that we want to invite in to learn our lives. Be the kind of person that we want to invite into our ceremonies to learn our protocols, to learn the most sacred. Be that kind of person and then that's how you get in. And with that, I think we should hear Janet Rogers last poem and then we're going to have a quick out with everybody because she speaks to this poetically. As long as the sun shines upon the earth, as long as the water still flows, as long as the grass grows at a certain time each year, forever, as long as Mother Earth is still in motion, still in motion, still in motion. It's hard work to maintain the middle row. One line makes eyes separating sides. They navigate a boat down a similar river. We paddle a canoe, packing values, never touching, forever separate, maintaining the course, step by step, laws of respect, intended to protect sacred relationships. Words from good minds, Gazwente, to Rowampo. Not treaty like it was told, but a non-apology, canoe and boat, ever flowing large water river, beyond democracy, boundaries, not borders. The law was not authored in an angry house of disputes, but rather inspired from witness to cause an effect of free will resulting in greed and corruption and unlawful things. Protection of our relationship to our mother, not better than the other, but something necessary to exercise caution, steady, Carry on, your side, our side. Maintaining the middle is most difficult. I is for Indian affairs. I is for indigenous. I is for imperialism. I is for identity. I is for Iroquois Haudenosaunee. I is for incident. I is for initiation. Forever, as long as the sun shines, as long as the water still flows, as long as the grass grows at a certain time each year, forever, as long as Mother Earth is still in motion, still in motion, still in motion, forever. And her got together before and talked about the stones and the crossing the it river. It was an amazing coincidence. That yeah. was brilliant. Um, well, thank you for uh, for being courageous and having this conversation uh, this ap this evening. I guess it's not an afternoon. It's this evening. Um, call to action. Each one of us has a very quick opportunity for to to put a shout out. Saul, you want to go first? Uh, yeah. So just real practical. 
tactically, um, my nation is going up and naming some defendants who are very big, have a lot of deep pockets, and we're a small community isolated in the North Coast. Raven has been a huge help, not only on the pulling together and stopping Enbridge in that temperate rainforest, which we call home, but we're also getting ready for a campaign to make the rights wrong that happened with Nathan E. Stewart. Um, so there's going to be events coming out and literature, and if you want to know more, come and talk to me. Um, but for us to have justice, we don't want to relinquish the decision-making authority to a bunch of Supreme Court justices or a bunch of justices anywhere. We're the decision-making authority, but right now to get justice, we need to go through the Canadian courts. Hopefully John's program will change that in the future, but right now, so I'm just saying calls to action. Um, you know, look up the Nathan E. Stewart, look at the work it's unpacked for our nation. We're going to have traditional law stuff coming out. So it's real practical. It's not high level. It's something you can do and it's something you can get engaged at in your community. Talk to your neighbors, have other courageous conversations that actually give life and breadth and depth to what we talked about tonight. Way. John? Um, Raven, a call to action is to look to their work and find ways to develop a relationship with the many opportunities that are present. Uh, the work, as you heard, is multi multi-dimensional, and uh, you can find a place in uh, that incredible menu of opportunities. If I may, uh, Trans Mountain somehow has got 22 more weeks to crash around on our coast uh, uh, in a chaotic kind of way. Uh, for the indigenous people, my people, Saanich people, for my constituents in Saanich North and the Islands, and indeed all of us here in the Salish Sea, uh, we need to stay on that one and, and thank Raven for the work that they've done. We need to keep working on that. Rose Henry is here with a quick comment. <laughs> You're talking to a person who's been called an elder. <laughs> How quick is quick? <laughs> um, but anyhow, so... You know, with the call to action, right from the grassroots level, outside the educational institutions, um, there is some grassroots people doing things. Um, one of the biggest call to actions is actually coming from the Indigenous youth. Over the next few months, they're looking at doing a border action to drive a message home. One of my nieces said it's like the Bannock slot both Trump and Trudeau over this pipeline, over the fish farms. So they're, they're actually, you know, we were just talking last night with them because they've actually made contact with the people from the Chumash Nation. They've made contact with the people from El Salvador. And so they're talking, you know, this is our Salish Sea. This is our, our life, right? And so these are you or in the ages, you know, that are all under 19, they're the ones that are going to be old enough to vote in the next elections. You know, so they're responding, and some of them are saying, is anybody listening? Is anybody listening right now? In the urban settings, in the urban settings, some of the uh, people are saying, who is there to represent the urban Aboriginal people? The people from, you know, um, the 60s street, the you know, uh, residential school survivors who cannot go home because there is no space for them in their, in their home territory. So the call to action is happening right now with you know, not a lot of fanfare at this point, but it's there. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank, Thank you Rose. all for joining us uh, in the room yeah. this evening. Thank you for joining us online this evening, I think we got to get out of here. I think we have to thank Sunset Labs yes. and yes. Stream Business. Big round of applause to thank them. And, and we have to thank I Raven. We have to thank Raven. Thank Raven, big round of hand for Raven. And while you're clapping, let's give a round of applause to our amazing panel, Adam, Saul, and John. And a round of applause for yourself for showing yeah, up. Thank you very much. Way to go. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>